Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and the Word of God says that when we get saved, we are saved unto good works. Those works are the fruits that God is looking for. Now you're capable of producing good works. Let's talk about this from the Word of God. Join me today on Student of the Word. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Glad to have you here today. Uh, I want to mention some things, okay? Today, you can begin by turning to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start there today. And I'm going to be teaching on the subject of good works found in the Word of God and also just general works, some works from a bad viewpoint and works from a good viewpoint. But I just simply want to say I have lots and lots of printed material, things you can download free, and that's called ministersclub.com. That is my branch of my ministry to offer things that, you know, I've got outlines on and there's just tons of outlines. And one thing I do recommend, don't take my outlines and just preach them, okay? Make them your own. I've got lots and lots of sermons, materials, and stuff from other ministers, but you know what? The best thing is just pray over them, mull them around on the inside, because there couldn't be anything worse than you taking exactly what somebody else said and then preaching it. And somebody asks you to defend a point, and you can't defend a point. You got it from somebody else. Take that and make it your own. So again, there's so much on there that's been a great blessing to you, ministersclub.com. But for everything else, I mean, all my offers, all these other things, bobyandian.com, is the place to go to. And while you're there, why don't you just plan on doing this? If you're not a partner with me, do so. While you're with bobyandian.com, there's a place there where you can join up and, and take my hand, one on one side, one on the other, all of you can stand next to me, help raise up my hand so that we can win this battle every single day and uh, see people set free, see people heal, see people delivered, see people called into the ministry, see those who've been born again actually begin to become disciples, get involved in a church. My thing, I'm not a church. Oh, I'm here as an assistant. I'm like parachurch. I stand beside a church, but I pastored for 33 years. And listen, not, not just don't treat me as your pastor. You can treat me as a pastor, but you need to have a pastor of your own. Get involved in the local local church. And so again, thank you for becoming a partner with me. Thank you ahead of time for joining me and doing that. And my listen, the giving you give to me should never replace the tithes you give to your church. That belongs to your church, but there's tithes and offerings mentioned in the word of God. And offerings are for for all that above your tithes. Tithes go to the church, but I'd love to have part of that offering. Enough people joining together with me make this show possible. Thank you so much. Ephesians 2, you should have found it by now. But let's talk about works and good works. In Ephesians chapter two, before I even read the passage, let me tell you the background on this. It's got to the point where many Christians is, is we've studied grace so much and thank God for the message of grace. It's been needed for so long because by hearing faith and faith only can almost turn into works where you know you have to say it so many times, confess it so many times, it becomes some kind of formula, never designed by God to do that. But grace has brought a great balance to that. But on the other hand, for by grace you save through faith that not of yourselves, it's not of works. People begin now as Christians to look at any form of works as bad. Oh, that's works. Look, there's a type of works that is not good, but there's a type of works that is good. When I was growing up, one of the shows that I used to like to watch was The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. I am dating myself right now. For a few of you that are close to the grave, you remember what I'm talking about, don't you? Again, you can remember with me. But on Dobie Gillis' show, there was a guy on there named Maynard Krebs on the show. And before hippies, there were, uh, this guy was on there. He was on there. He was kind of predating hippies at that time. And anyway, he was lazy as could be. Anytime a person would mention the word work, he would scream out, work, work. No. In other words, what the guy would say, well, I don't think that'll work. Work. He would cry out. No, no matter where work was put in there, he would take his, I'm not going to work. That's almost happened today. Anytime a Christian mentions the word work, there's Christians that go, work. No, no, no. Works are bad. Works are bad. No, works are good. What I'm going to tell you is there's a type of works you can come to God with that he will not accept, but there's another type of works you come to him he's looking for. Let's find it here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Notice this is not of works. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. If you're coming to Jesus to get saved, you cannot offer your works to God because that is not the basis for salvation. That's why it said is the gift of God and not of works. It's like I'm offering you a gift and you keep trying to pay for it. No, 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 no. I love you so much. I want you to have this. 
this. You go, well, I feel wrong taking it. Here's money. No, no, don't try to pay for it. It cheapens it. Any type of work you can offer trying to merit Jesus as your Lord and Savior cheapens the work of the cross. God says, in essence, let me give it to you. But once you're born again, then you are saved unto good works. So any kind of work trying to get salvation from God or as a Christian trying to get forgiveness of God, that type of work is wrong. When it comes to sin, don't try to get rid of sin as a sinner or as a Christian by offering works to God. But once you do come to God and his Holy Spirit moves inside of you, then God is preparing you unto good works. And the works he's talking about here are works as a Christian. And these are not works before God, their works in front of people. I produce good works. James tells us about this. In fact, we'll quote it here in just a moment. And that is we produce good works to show the world around us that we are a child of God. I didn't use works to become a child of God, but because God can see inside my heart, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. God can see my faith inside. He doesn't have to see my good works, but because people can't see in my heart, they have to see the demonstration. That's why Philippians says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's inside of me as a Christian needs to come to the outside where the world can see it. And I am now saved unto good works, which God has before ordained that we, you and I should walk in them. Walk in what? Walk in good works. The moment I get born again, God wants me to start walking in good works in front of the world. Those works won't save me, but it shows the world I am saved. I'm working because I'm already saved, not trying to get saved. And as a Christian, I'm not working to try to get back into fellowship with God if I have sinned. I'm walking with God because he has forgiven me by the same grace he forgave me as a sinner. He now forgives me as a Christian walking with him in daily life. So it comes back to this, only a Christian can be indwelled and controlled by the Holy Spirit at the same time, but a sinner cannot. A sinner cannot get the Holy Spirit by his works, cannot receive eternal life by his works. The Holy Spirit can't come to live in him by his works. No, that all comes by simple faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But once I am born again and the Holy Spirit lives in me and my life is controlled by the Holy Spirit, one of the first things the Holy Spirit says, let's go take care of people. Let's mention their needs. Let's take care of them. Let's do some good works in front of them. So can we be justified by works? What I've been talking about is yes, to a certain degree, not in front of God, but in front of people. James chapter two, turn there with me. James chapter two, we're gonna take a look at verses 14 through 18. Then we're gonna jump down to verses 20 through 26. In James two, verse 14, it says, what does it profit my brothers if a man says, he has faith, but he has no works. I like what the uh, Amplified uses this right here. Instead of the word works, it uses the word corresponding actions. What does it profit my brothers and sisters if a man says he has faith, but he has no corresponding actions? There is no actions out here to confirm what he's saying with his mouth. He's saying he has faith, but he never does anything to show it. It says, can that type of faith save him? The answer is no, but it's before people, not before God. His works didn't save him before God, but in front of people, they need to see something. And so literally what the Greek says is, can that type of faith save him? The answer is no. Again, in front of people, if a brother or sister is naked, and has no daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, yet you do not give them the things they need for their body, what does it profit them? The answer is nothing. Even so, faith, that is toward God, if it has no corresponding actions in front of people, is dead. It's alive to God, but dead in this world, being alone. In other words, you're no better than a sinner. You're not a sinner, but you're no better as far as affecting the world than a sinner is. A man may say he has faith, and I may say I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Here's the whole point of it. Faith is designed to show you I have faith. But if I have faith and don't have works, what good is it? My faith stands alone. My faith on the inside of me as a Christian living in this world needs actions that correspond with it. My faith needs works to work with it to actually get out here in this world to show them I'm a Christian. I need to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. What happens when I do that? I am showing the world the power of God that's on the inside of me. His healing power that was given to Jesus has now been given to me. 
Outward works display our faith to the world. Faith in the heart shows our salvation to God, but outward works are our salvation before the world. So can that type of faith save me? It can in front of the world whenever I walk my faith in front of them, use my faith in front of them, live for Jesus every single day. It shouldn't be something I purposely commit to and pound my fist and say, I'm gonna live for Jesus today. It should be so much a part of my life, I can't help but live for Jesus. I don't even think about it. When foul language is around me, I turn away from it. You know why? I don't use foul language. And when people run down God and talk about there is no sound, I don't join in with them, no. There's something in me that backs off from that and I say exactly the opposite. And then I stand up for the things of God. And I find out there's a group of people around me that agree with it. Every time somebody starts to run, you know, oftentimes Christians go, ooh, I'm not gonna say anything. But the moment I mention something about God, they all join in. Why? Because they find out I'm not the only one here. It goes on to say in verse 20, but will you know, O empty man, that faith without works is dead. Faith toward God without accompanying actions is actually dead. It's alive toward God, but dead as far as producing anything. And it says in verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son on the altar? Listen to this. When he was justified by works, when he offered his son on the altar was years after he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. We're told there back in uh, the Old Testament, in chapter 12 of, of Genesis, but we're also told in Romans chapter four that Abraham had faith in the Lord. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Where did, was his righteousness? In him. Who saw that? God did. But it was years later when he actually in front of people showed people he truly trusted God over everything and was willing to offer his son on the altar. That's when he had works in front of people years after. So work should always come after we are saved. And that's what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 was telling us, that they should come afterwards. And then in verse 10, we're actually saved unto good works. Uh, we're gonna come back after the break. I call it halftime, but we're gonna come back after, after the break. Think about what I've been offering here. And we do have again an offer on this to teach you on the subject here of what I'm talking about that literally works are demanded in our life, not just asked for, demanded in our life after we become born again. Why do you think God left us here? If works were not important, he'd take us to heaven immediately and we poof would disappear here and appear in heaven. But he left us here, why? To show the world the power of God, that not only has God saved me, I want you to see it in my life. It actually has changed my life around me. And listen, one of the greatest testimonies you can have is from people who have known you for years. It says you used to be this way, now you're this way. I thought this would only last for a while, but it's lasted for years. This must truly be a real act of God in your life. That's the power of good works before the world. See you right after the break. The Beatitudes are the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. They are divided into two sections, being hearers and being doers of God's Word. In this seven-lesson series titled Grace for Growth, Bobby Indian breaks down the Beatitudes and explains the steps to spiritual maturity. Grace for Growth is available as a seven CD series for $30 or as an MP3 download for $15. To order, visit our website at bobbyendian.com. I've been waiting on this book, Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College, and it's my favorite class. I think the students' favorite class is there. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult, but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. When I used to pastor at the church, I would even tell, I'd say, housewives, you that are listening out there today in the congregation, this is designed for you too. The Word of God is not difficult. Go to my website, bobtheandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. 
You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Back again to James chapter two, take a look with me at verse 20. We talked about the fact of what profit we have in this world whenever we get born again and then start to show it in front of the world. That's why God left us here. And we're gonna take up so many verses of scripture showing good works, good works, good works. And this is again, what we were saved unto. We were saved unto good works. And that was Ephesians chapter two and verse 10. So verse 20 here now tells us here in James, but will you know, oh, empty man, the word vain means empty, that faith without works, and like I said, corresponding actions, that faith without corresponding actions is dead. The faith is alive toward God, but dead in this world. We need to take the faith that's inside of us and put it to work and show the world around us that that faith is alive. How do they know faith is alive? We clothe those that are naked. We feed those that are hungry. We also lay hands on the sick and see them recover. We minister to people around us. This is taking what's inside of us. And as it says in Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's in me needs to be worked to the outside where people can see it. Look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? This is in front of the world not before God. We're never justified before God by our works, but people can't see the faith in our heart. They have to see the results of it, which is a change of action. What's in us comes to the outside. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? That's in front of the world. When he had offered Isaac his son on the altar, and this was years after his salvation. Don't you see how that faith worked together or partnered together with his works. And by works, his faith was made perfect or completed. My faith in me still desiring to do more, but the next thing it has to do is my works come out and then show a completed faith. A completed faith actually starts doing something for people, not sitting down, knowing you're saved, going to heaven, and then doing nothing after that. I have been left here to affect the lives of others by my words and by my deeds, by the words that I speak speak, the messages I give to people, and also by laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover, ministering to their natural needs on this earth so they'll come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Verse 23 goes on to say, and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. The scripture that Abraham was justified before God is talking about his salvation, but then it's totally fulfilled in that Abraham went and in front of people showed what was in his heart. He didn't just keep it secret. I know I'm a Christian. You know what? It's private. No, it's never private. If it was private, God would haul you off to heaven and rapture you the moment you get saved. It is not private. It is to be displayed and showed to the world. That's that's why you have been left here. That's why you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been given to you for power to witness. And power to witness means to take it to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The scripture which fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God, it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Verse 25, we have a now another one. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works in front of the world, not when she accepted the Lord, but years after when she received the spies. And then she sent them out by another way. This was years after salvation. Let me tell you the story. When the two spies came to her, and came uh, to, to find out from her, and they were led by the Holy Spirit to her house. Once they got there, the first thing she said to them was, what took you so long? They said, what do you mean what took us so long? She said, 40 years we've known this land belong to you. For 40 years, our knees have been knocking against each other. Ever since God split the Red Sea, we knew this place was yours, and we've been walking in fear of you. And they probably thought to themselves, what do you mean a year out of out of uh, Egypt, we sent spies in here and 10 came back with a bad report. And they were talking about how all 10 of them were afraid of the giants. And if they would have told that to her, she'd have gone, are you guys nuts? The giants were afraid of you. 
And so by understanding that, now here they were standing there all these years later, and she simply said to them, your God is God in heaven above and earth beneath. She accepted the Lord as her Savior. And now, some 39 years later, to prove it, she hid the spies with fear of her own life. I mean, these there were guards that came in looking for them. She said, oh no, you just missed them. They just ran off that way. And she actually had them on the roof, hidden under the flax that was up there that she made rope out of. And they were hidden there. And then she went up and she sent them out a different way. So they managed to escape. Here's the point. This was her outward demonstration to the two men that were there. And also later of questioned by anybody else. And also because of her, her own parents had now got saved. And now they were going to be delivered that when the city of Jericho was destroyed, they would be set free. And she actually became a member of the nation of Israel. So again, it says in verse 22, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The body is the display, physical display of the spirit inside of us. Works is the natural display of the invisible faith that's in our hearts. So works don't justify us before God. That's Romans chapter four and verse two. But works do justify us before people, before the world. They show them our faith. You know, I was watching a, a, a program one weekend and a very liberal man, very, very liberal man from Washington, high up in the government, went back home to Chicago that weekend and was actually dedicating a park. They asked him while he said, there's a park and said, would you just dedicate this? He said, yeah. And so they had the national news standing around and all this. And I guess he got a photo op he hadn't planned on. But while he was standing there, he answered some questions. And one of the questions was this. And that was, what about Christians? You know, why do you seem to hate Christians? He said, we don't hate Christians. We don't like the Christians that believe the Bible and then live by it. Whoa, what a statement. It's not Christians we don't like. It's those Christians who believe the Bible, then live by it. What was he saying? We hate the ones that are born again and live by it. They work. They show their works in this earth, and that's what we can't stand. That's what we are against. So Satan himself doesn't like you getting saved, but if you do get saved, he then goes to the next phase. Don't live like it. Keep it secret. Hold it inside of yourself. That way, just you will get saved and nobody else will. Why? Because the world is saved not only by the words we speak, but by the actions we produce, the life we live in the world. One of my first jobs working for a grocery store, I, I, my first job was working in a grocery store. I was sacking groceries. Back in those days, people did it for you and then carried it out to your car. I was one of those boys that did it, put in paper sacks, rolled it out your car and put it in your car. Well, there was this one lady that griped about everything I did. I could not do anything right. Everything was wrong. This shouldn't belong in that bag. This should be in that bag. This bag shouldn't touch this bag. All, all through the whole thing. And by the time I got back in, I was upset. I was banging carts one into another, walked down to the checkout stand, and the girl that was there that checked out the groceries just looked at me and kept looking at me. She said, I've never seen you angry. I've never seen you lose your temper. And all of a sudden, I was convicted. You know why? Because that one thing right there probably discredited some of the things I had been living for. I apologized to her because you know what? I honestly had been living for the Lord and never noticed it. It wasn't until the fact I blew my mind and blew my temper and all that stuff that she said that and acquainted me with the fact, you know what? I've been walking with God all this time. It wasn't something I tried to do. I wasn't trying to work for the Lord. I wasn't trying to show my good works to the world. It was just something that came out of me because why? I so loved Jesus, so loved his word. It was so much a part of my thinking and so much a part of my mind, the mind of Christ that literally I just lived it in front of people. So what are good works? There are good works and there are bad works. There are right and wrong uses of works, and this is what makes a work good or bad. A work in and of itself might be giving an offering. That is nothing wrong with that, but what's the motive behind it? What is the thinking behind it? So again, there are good works and bad works, but there's right and wrong uses of the works. You can't find one scripture defining works and then make all the other scriptures fit it. When the Bible says that we're not saved by works, that doesn't mean that works are bad. It is if you're trying to get saved. But to take that one scripture, and then every time you find the word works, say, oh, God is not pleased with works. God is pleased with works if it's after salvation. If it's taking and living it before the world, that's what works are intended for. But if you come to God with your good works to get saved, you start flouting all your church attendance, the size of the offerings you have given, how long you've been going to church, how you've been faithful to your wife, you haven't committed adultery, 
none of those things will save you because if those things can save you, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? We're not saved by our acts and deeds of righteousness, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So again, you can't find one scripture defining works to make all other scriptures fit it. Works are wrong when they are used to win God's approval, to get God's love, or to win the praises of people around you. But works are good when used to show God's love and to exhort and restore believers back into fellowship with God or especially to win the lost. Because there's times when even just the things you do can help to win the lost. You know, part of witnessing is laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. It's part of your witnessing. In fact, Paul said in chapter 15 of the book of Romans, he said that when I came from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he was saying was, if signs and wonders don't follow your ministry, you are not fully preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That verse is where Pentecostals got the term full gospel. Full gospel means it's not just by words only, it's by deeds. And Jesus went about everywhere healing the sick and then also forgiving those of their sins when they came to him. And with all that put together, he won the lost. This is what God is simply telling us. So works can be used to help win the lost and even laying hands on the sick are called the works. The works that I do shall you do also in greater works. So works are right and wrong by the motive that backs them up. Good works are our entrance into the world, into society that's around us. Another word for works is, hang on to this, witnessing. Witnessing is good works good words and good deeds in front of the world. So this is what, again, the word works is discussing. We are saved unto good works. Once I'm born again, I'm supposed to start producing good works in front of the world. I ask you, think about this. Is the main way that you witness to people is by the words of your mouth? That's wonderful. We're supposed to do that. But I want you to think about some other things. Not only that, but how about laying hands on a sick person? You lay hands on a sick person and watch them get healed right in front of you. And I'll tell you what, they'll probably... 99% of the time, open up their heart to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But here's another thing. Works are not necessarily only laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. It's by the fact that when you see a person in need, you help them. And honestly, you put clothes on them to help them understand, I'm giving you this natural coat, but I want you to understand too, God wants to give you the robes of righteousness. This coat can represent an eternal coat. This coat that will wear out one day can represent an eternal coat that will never wear out. I can feed a, a person who's hungry to help them understand, I'm giving you a loaf of bread, but there's also the bread of righteousness, the bread of eternity eternal life, the bread of God's word that I want you to grow in. So again, there's something else added to it. Your works are so important. I'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.